The Yoruba Pan Social Political Group, Afeni Fere, has criticized President Muhammad Buhari, describing him as an unrepentant tribalist. Its Secretary General, Shola Ebisengi, uh, in reaction to the President's interview with a broadcast media organization, said his engagement was full of lies, inconsistencies, contradictions, and utter disrespect for the ethnic nationalities, including their elected governors. On the issue of open grazing, they said the president um, should be told that the Yoruba people are solidly behind the governors, that not an inch of land in the southern region will be carved out for any grazing reserves or cattle colony. Well, joining us to discuss this is Adewale Justice and Ayodele Adewale, both public affairs analysts. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. So I'm going to try to start with you, um, Ayodele. The, the issue of Mr. President's um, interview yesterday, of course, it has many parts. Um, uh, a lot of people have criticized Mr. President's response to a lot of things. But let's look at Afeni Ferrer's perspective in, in terms of the fact that uh, the president seems to be um, uh, someone who segregates against certain parts of this country. Um, we know that there are several ethnic tensions right now across the country um, based off of the fact that the president, according to them, had not dealt with the issue of insecurity when he started. And now it's a full-blown uh, you know, um, problem that we all uh, in different parts of the country have to deal with. Um, do you share the same opinion with Afeni Ferrer? And if you don't, why? Well, uh, first and foremost, I, I think uh, tempers need to be calm, and uh, people need to also try to look at the issue beyond the surface and all of that. I find it very, very right to say that uh, the herders should uh, have their ranch. Uh, it's a private business as such. So the private business should not infringe on the right of order the lives and property has been lost. Uh, the president also is very right to say that uh, the security, first and foremost, and very fundamentally lies in the hands of the state and the local government because they are the first in line when it comes to such matters. Uh, before the matter is brought to Abuja, I remember when I was chairman of local government, we used to have a monthly security council meeting that had uh, that has uh, the, the military, uh, such as the, uh, the, the army, the navy, the DSS, the police, the NSCDC, the immigration, the traditional rulers, and of course the various faiths that exist within my local government uh, and the community leaders. But are those people are those people able to give? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But are those people capable of calling the shots? Because Yes, you are security officers or chief security officers in your domain um, on paper. But in reality, yeah. you do have to work with security agencies. Can you call the shots for them? Can you tell them when to jump and when as, to move? If we look at the case as it is now, it has grown beyond. It has grown beyond the state government and the local government. I was giving a narrative how it should be and how evil structures have been activated very, very well we will not get to the state where we find ourselves now. But we have found ourselves here, and I think the best we can do, just like the Lagos government does, uh, in the Ministry of, of, of Agri. I know there are Agri uh, farm settlements, there are Agri lands that the Lagos state government do readily lease out to farmers who are interested in such uh, dealings and, and all of that. And I think people should also take the method of the Ondo state government and the uh, former governor of, uh, of, of, of AKT state, uh, Mr. Rodney Fireshi, as controversial as some of his uh, programs were, but he was able to also make a statement and, of course, affirm and uh, make the issue at, 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 at the initial and did not allow it to grow out of, out of, out, out of process huh. or, or out of way. Okay. Uh, the southern governors are met, they made their, their, their resolution known, and they have to move forward to, to enforce such. And I don't think I, I, I don't think these issues are beyond what 
which the major states can, can, can handle. Okay. And uh, look at what the Lagos State Government did recently to um, empower the, the, the police within their jurisdiction law by providing some level of support. And I think with technological uh, equipment also, like drones and, and all of these things, uh, think, think, think things can still be very handled and we can I'm, all live together. I'm going to come back to you on the Lagos State Government and what it's done in terms of its security because uh, there's a lot to deal with. But let me go to, uh, I'm going to come to Adewale. I don't know if he's still on the phone. Is, is he still on the phone? Yeah, okay. yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, um, but let me let me let me stay with you because I think Adewa, Ade, 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 uh, Mr. Justice is not on the phone right now. You're talking about what Lagos State Government has done every single day for the past few days. Um, there has been reports of broad daylight robbery. So I'm trying to look at the reality, how realistic what the Lagos State Government has done on paper. Um, the effect it has on the daily lives of people. Lagos used to be one of those states where you have hope that, you know, we're safe. But unfortunately, that's not the case. In fact, um, I think last month we also had reports of people being kidnapped while they're going for runs in Lagos, of all places. So when you say that the government of Lagos State has done something in dealing with the insecurity that we're facing, how, how well has that worked out? Well, what I mean is that looking at what Lagos State did yesterday, it provided more support to the police uh, to also reinforce them and uh, to, to help them to combat crime. Uh, what you see or what we are seeing is an outfall of the hijack of the NSAS protests, of the hijack particularly, and uh, the police morale has been dampened, broken. And it takes some, it will take some time to build up that, that morale. And that means the police themselves must have to, if I may use the word, change themselves. Because the Lagos State government have given uh, adequate support. It might not be holistic, but at least adequate for the number of personnel that are needed to be deployed. So to be host on the peace now. To do that, like I, like I told you uh, not too long ago, that I used to be the chairman of a local government, and I know how I handled my local government. Okay. And it's not solely leave it in the hands of the police, but of course, working with the various divisional police officers, I knew the black spots, and I knew how to arrange men putting boots on the ground at least 300 meters to 1,000 meters apart. At some certain times, they just have to be there, to, you know. To, to, to put their presence and, and weed off any unforeseen situation. Okay. Mr. Justice, um, I'm, I'd like to point out some of the things that Afeni Ferrer has said concerning Mr. President's interview uh, from yesterday. Uh, they had said that the President's outburst was full of lies, inconsistencies, contradictions, Total disrespect for ethnic nationalities, including state governors. I remember the president saying that governors need to not just vie for offices and sit and wait for the federal government to do their jobs. Uh, and my question is, if power is at the center, uh, and, and we all know that the security chiefs, um, the, the forces and the uh, detachments that are in different states wait for the federal government uh, or orders uh, from the bosses at the, at the center before anything can be done. Can governors really be blamed? Again, on the issue of open grazing, governors of 17 out of 36 states of the Federation have already put a ban out on open grazing. But the presidency has come out to say that he is in support of open grazing. Does this not bring some form of confusion as to how we deal with this issue of farmer header crisis? Unfortunately, we will have to let Mr. Justice go because his connection is very bad. But back to you, um, Mr. Dewale, I guess that you're going to be answering all of these questions. So let's talk about the issue of open grazing. 17 state governors uh, out of 36 states, uh, including the FCT, have said, uh, because, you know, again, you have said that governors have a job to do. They have decided that they want to make sure that they protect the lives and property of the people in their states. And they have taken this stand. But the, governor, uh, the president has come out um, ordering um, the AGF to go ahead and get land or acquire some land for open grazing routes, as, a, as opposed to the powers that the state governors have, like 
somebody uh, I spoke to a few minutes ago did tell us that the powers uh, uh, to, or the right to land lies with states. So why would the federal government be putting out such a, a message? Well, I think you just answered a question from your narrative. You said the president directed the Attorney General to lie with the state government in order to get some open grazing routes. If those routes do not infringe on the right of other people, like farmers and all of that, I think those routes can also be fenced and it becomes a ranch and all of that. Like the county state government did to provide uh, a very big uh, zero guard, that they call it, and all of that. And uh, they also provided. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a difference between a grazing route and a, and a, and a cattle ranch. I'm sorry, there's a difference between a grazing route and a cattle ranch. Now, if you must have a ranch, we all know the procedure. No, I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. You said, you said, I'm quoting you, you said that the president directed the attorney general to with the state government to provide grazing routes, right? And I said, those routes can be converted into a ranch as long as it does not infringe on the right of others. And those routes can be fenced off. You can't fence off a route. If you've been to London before, you see the train, the train tracks. You understand the British government fenced off their train track to prevent people from committing suicide and all what uh, of, 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 of other atrocities and all of that. So if the federal government is liaising with the state government to, I mean, to preserve these grazing routes, it also means that the federal government must have to fence off these grazing routes so that this cattle will not move out of these grazing routes. And it implies that the grazing route becomes a ranch. That's what I'm saying. Hmm. This is not the first time that the idea of ranching has been thrown out there. But then, of course, these herders have said that they're nomadic in nature, and this is how it works. There has been a system that has been in place over time. And, of course, this is how they have continued in that light. But now the state governors have decided that no more open grazing. If you want land, you have to pay for it. You have to, you know, there's a modus operandi. Uh, and so you're, you're agreeing with me, obviously. You're saying that since the governors have taken this stand, no matter what the president says, it is the, the power lies with the state governors to decide Definitely. whether they can get the land. land. The, the constitution provides land is put in the hands of the state. Yeah. So if, and I'm very sure the president knows that. That's why he has told the attorney general, according to you, that we should align with the state government. Now, if the federal government still insists on their grazing routes, what I think the state government should put on the table is that the federal government should provide the funds, you understand, to fence off these grazing routes so that no cattle will move out of the routes. And they must also put technology to make sure that these routes are also well protected from pastoral uh, rustlers. You understand? Mm -hmm. and, and all of these things, issue will be solved. Or the state government can also assist the federal government at the request of the federal, and the federal also must meet with the terms and conditions of each state to provide huge lands that can be turned into a ranch. Mm -hmm. And totally for a ranch. Let's talk about, finally, because we're going to wrap up, we're almost out of time. Um, Afeni Ferrer has claimed that the president has um, always been a tribalist. Uh, he, they point out uh, the lopsidedness in um, his appointment. Uh, they claim that the president has no solution, but rather that his body language is more of a braggadocious person. In fact, they uh, are saying that the president has continuously only said things that would be too sensitive uh, and would cost, uh, you know, um, they said that the president, apparently, I'm just trying to uh, uh, change the statement. They're saying that the president is making certain parts of this country, different ethnic nationalities, feel less than others. Um, but quickly, the president did say 
recently before this interview that he's done everything. In fact, he said he'd done his best in dealing with the issue of insecurity. And I can never forget that video because he did say, what else do we want him to do? That he's done everything in his power to deal with this insecurity. If our president is saying that he's done everything in his power, and yet we still have insecurity, as at today, a hundred students have been kidnapped from a polytechnic again in Kaduna State. Does this mean the president is out of ideas? Does this mean that the president has failed? Is he telling us that we will continuously live through this insecurity because he has done his best and maybe his best is not good enough? I'm not the spokesperson of the president, but I just want to speak like a realist now. We have separation of powers. You have states, you have local, and you have the president. I believe that in this separation of powers, each and every structure of government must work together. The first thing in security is, is for you to have information. The president cannot get adequate information at the local level if there's no cooperation from the local level down to the state for the various security agencies to put into action and stimulate their data and all of that. We will get that quite frankly well. In terms of logistics and financing, the federal government will not deploy all of their resources to protect the state and, of course, protect the local. Each of them also has some level of resources to be deployed into effective security of their various territories. That is why I made an example from the Lagos State government that dipped its hands into their, 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 their financial strain in order to support the, the federal government. I am an advocate of state police. I'm an advocate of local government police. Until we reach that end, I think the states and the local must move more frontal to work with the communities, the various communities to get information, and they must form a synergy with the federal government in order to tackle all of these things. If right. we keep dumping everything to the federal government alone, we will not solve this problem. Well, you I can want imagine to... you bringing a police officer all the way from Sokoto to come and police somewhere in, the, in Lagos State or in Delta State and all of that. It cannot work. And okay. in Reprovers also, you take people down there, it cannot work. So we need to develop a strong synergy. But above all, we also need to restructure all of our constitution. Well, thank you very, thank you so much. To have state police and arm their police. Local right. government, have local government police, arm their police, All and right. fund it effectively. We need to go. We need to go. Ayadele Adewale is a political uh, analyst. Thank you very much for being part of this conversation. We appreciate your thoughts. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, we'll take a short break. And when we return, I will give you my take. Stay with us. Here's my take. For every time we expect and maybe feel that we're making a headway in this country, especially in the fight against insecurity, we come to realize that we've taken 10 steps back. It's not because we're a country filled with clueless people, no. It's because we are a country with leaders who know what to do, but rather than do it, we seem to politicize it and ultimately make it about ourselves, all at the expense of the common man. Why? Why make us suffer when you promised us peace? Why, why let the bloodshed continue when you assured us of our safety? Why play ping pong with the future of our dear country because the aftermath doesn't affect you? It's really unfortunate that our leaders swing into action when calamity hits close to home. Only they fix the roads if you know their friends or their families live on that street. They only work in their interest, but our collective interest seems to be of no value. And I ask, why? Because people are dying on a daily basis. People are being kidnapped by bandits, killed by terrorists, and all they do is talk tough, but we see no action. How many more Nigerians must fall at the hands of these killers for the Buhari administration to come to our aid and be alive to its responsibilities? Should we stop shouting and screaming because it seems like we're not being heard? Should we throw in the towel and maybe wait the next few years what 
will we tell our children? That we did not fight for the soul of our country? We must stop, I mean, we must keep pushing. We must keep fighting. We must keep talking until the right thing is done. We cannot give up. I'm Mary Annicole, thanking you for watching. Do have a good evening.